let's imagine that I ran a pizza shop and I wanted to create an application that did everything for my pizza shop. I was doing it from scratch. Maybe a chain of pizza shops would be better to think of. Um, there would be a lot of information that I would want to get to run my business, right? Um, just think on the, the, from the simplest thing to the most involved thing. Um, all the different information that we could get. For example, we might want to have it so that someone calls in and orders, places an order, that we can take their order for the pizza and give them an accurate price and give them a time that they can pick it up. All right? So, you know, it's going to take 20 minutes to bake this and it, uh, the total amount of your order is going to be $35. All right, that might be one thing that we would want to use our system for. We might want to use our system to ke help keep track of orders that are in the oven. We might want to have a screen that allowed people to um, see, like, well, this pizza's been in there since such and such time. It has three minutes more. Oh, it has two minutes more. Okay, time to take it out. We might want to have a screen that shows the delivery schedule of, of of where our delivery drivers were, what, what delivery runs they were on, when they were going to be back, all sorts of things like that. That's just managing the day-to-day -day operations of a pizza place. You might, want, you might want some sort of application that would help with that. Now, if you think on a larger scale of running the business strategically, things like how much ingredients to buy. How much tomato sauce do we buy? Or if we're making it from scratch, how many tomatoes do we buy? Or how much flour? Or how much cheese? Or how much pepperoni? Or mushrooms? Or whatever. We're going to get our best guess from that based on what we did in the past, right? If we sold X number of pizzas in a week, and each pizza takes so many ounces of tomato sauce, we can figure out, well, what we did this week, and we can maybe make a forecast about what the, the, what ingredients we need for the upcoming week. Things like how many orders we had, how many of them were for delivery, so we could figure out how many delivery drivers we need to hire. All right? How big of an oven we need to bake. Whether we should open another place, like if, our, if, if we had, let's say, an Illyria location and it was just getting pounded, maybe we open up one in a different part of the city to sort of even out and balance it. If, if the one was doing good business, maybe we would need to open up another one, all right, to, 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 um, you, know, to, uh, to you know, to, to, to gain even more profits and, and be able to sell to more people and so on. There's a lot of things both day-to-day, -day, fundamentally, and, and strategically that we would want to know to run our business. So. One thing, though, that we'd want to make sure of is we'd want to make sure that a pizza, all the code relating to pizza was in one place. All right? If, for example, we had a recipe app that said how to make a pizza, you know, had an instruction, someone calls in for such and such pizza, use four ounces of tomato sauce on this, for example. Well, we want to make sure when we want to do a calculate our inventory to figure out how much tomato sauce that we use the same four ounces in the calculation. We wouldn't want one place where it said four ounces, one place that said five ounces. So it's important for us to have our code put in just one place. All right? So everything about a pizza is going to live in one place. All right? And then we can, we can build from there, pizza. Uh, there are, uh, besides pizzas, there are orders that are placed, right? person places an order might be for one or two or three pizzas, right? You don't have to deliver each pizza individually. You deliver an order of pizzas. So you can deliver three or five or however many pizzas are ordered. So you need to keep track of orders, um, both so that you can dispatch the driver and if you're doing calculations of how many drivers you need. should be talking the same language should be the same sort of code involved. The code should be in all in one place. So in a nutshell, what we're going to have, what we're going to build is we're going to build components for our major business entities, for lack of a better word. All right? And these components can be accessed through any number 
of user interfaces. So what we're going to have is going to look something like this. And this isn't like a formal drawing. This is just sort of a informal drawing. I'll just put two of them up here now. I'll put a third one up here, maybe customers. Then we're going to have all sorts of GUIs that can access these in different ways. Access the different components in different ways and do different things with it. For example, if we had a screen that showed the orders that were placed in the restaurant, we might allow someone to place through a mobile application an order. Well, that would be one GUI, the mobile application, all right, updating the orders, and then the restaurant can immediately see the order that was placed, and so on. The point is, is when we build this, we're going to have multiple GUI. There are going to be multiple uses for these business entities. We're going to use them in running the day-to-day -day operations. We're going to use them in strategically planning what we want to do. But the idea is, is anywhere we need information about a pizza, that code needs to be in one place, all right? So that we're not having something that's inconsistent. So we don't have a bit of code in one place, a bit of code somewhere else that could say different things, all right? So we're going to be building components. And these are usually called business logic components. Um, maybe a better way to say it is problem domain logic objects. Because you know, it might not be a business. You might have a game, for example. All right, it's not really a business, but logic for how you roll a dice could live in those, or, or rock, paper, scissors, or whatever. All right. So, and these objects are going to talk to a bunch of different GUIs. All right. Now, here's what we're going to do in this class, at least to start. For the first, I don't know how many weeks, eight, nine weeks of this course, our focus is going to be on these guys writing the business components that solve a particular problem. All right? Now, we're not going to talk about GUIs until much later in the course. Why is that? Well, because making GUIs in Java is a little tricky. All right? And really, studying Java is a lot about making these. And making the GUIs, we're going to save till later. But still, we're going to need a way to test out these components. So we're going to write what is called unit test components that will take the place of a GUI. All right? So every one of our applications, every one of our assignments, we're going to have one unit test, at least one unit test class. And we're going to have one or more than one business logic or problem domain logic component or class, all right? And that's how the applications are going to work. Normally, you'd have a GUI. Like, normally, you'd have something where you could select the kind of pizza someone wants to add and uh, select what toppings they want on it, then add the second pizza to their order, and how big a, is that pizza, and what kind of cheese you want on that pizza, and so on and so forth. We're not going to have those GUIs, so we're going to write test classes, unit test classes. Let me talk about the difference between unit tests and system tests. Unit tests are testing an individual component or set of components. System tests are testing everything all together, including the GUIs and everything. Our focus is going to be on testing the components, all right? making sure the components are correct. The idea is, is that a system is a set of components that talk to each other. So you really need both types of testing. You need to make sure that the individual components, first of all, work. Then you need to test to make sure they work when they're talking to each other. So when they're talking to each other, that's called system testing. When we're testing individual components, that's called unit testing. So our focus early on is going to be on unit testing. We're going to build a component, and we're going to test it. 
What do I mean by test it? I mean if we give it inputs, we get the outputs that we expect. All right? So that's what we're going to do. So we're not going to be using GUIs. You don't have to enter data from the command line or anything like that. We're going to hard code data, but we're going to hard code specific test cases to make sure that our code works. All right? Uh, a few terms I want to define, and, and um, this is going to be a definition that's going to evolve probably throughout the course, and, and you're going to understand this, I think, on a deeper and deeper level as you go through this course. But two words I want to define, first of all, are the difference, are object and class. And what's the difference between an object and a class? Does anyone care to define what a class is? Okay. The gist of what you're coding about. Okay, it, it does. Does anyone want to expand on that? It's a framework for your code. That's true also. Yes? Um, a group of like objects in a way. Yeah, all right. Um, a class is, is sort of a template for objects. A class is the code that all the objects of a particular type have in common. It's all that we know about a given business entity and all the actions that we can perform for a business entity. All right? For example, and we're going to start this small and, 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 and build it. Um, what would be, and attributes are like characteristics. They would be like pieces of data about. Um, methods are, are, to really oversimplify it, are, to class, are, are, are calculations or actions that a member of the class can perform. What would be some attributes of a student? Characteristics of a student. Their grades, yeah. Their major. Their major. Student ID. Student ID. The classes they took, the grade they got in those classes, their name, their student ID, um, their major, address, email address, um, phone number maybe, and, and so on down the line. Those are characteristics. In a class, we define what characteristics exist for a given entity, all right? What would be an action? What would be a calculation or an action that might be performed with a student? Their GPA. Their GPA, all right? GPA is a calculation. You would take the individual grades and apply the appropriate math and say that they have a 3.5 GPA or whatever. What would be another class or, or uh, action that, uh, or, or calculation that could be performed with a student? That, that's very true. You can calculate their age. You have their date of birth, you calculate their age. So the attribute might be date of birth or the birth date. The, the method would be calculate their age. So you would take current date and do the, do the math on that. You calculate their tuition. All right. A student can enroll in a class. A student can drop a class. Uh, a student can graduate. Um, a lot of things that student activities of students are, can, can perform uh, and can be performed on students and uh, calculations that can be performed. The class is going to have a template for all those things. It's going to specify what we're interested in about students in our particular application. So we're interested in a student's name, absolutely. We're interested in a student's um, ID number, absolutely. We're interested in uh, the list of classes that they're taking, absolutely. We're interested in the grades that they've gotten in those classes, absolutely. All those things that are attributes will be stored as part of the student class. So it's a component. So I'll use component and class pretty much synonymous, all right? In addition to all the calculations or actions that the student can, be, can perform, all right? Those are in a class. What is an object then? Exactly, an individual student. So in the class for student, we'll say that a student has a name. That's all we define for 
a class, is that students have a name. Students have a, uh, a, uh, an address. Students have a student ID. Students have that. That's what we define on the class. In the individual object, we set those parameters, we set those attributes for an individual student, and then we can do the class, the, the, the calculations or, or processes or anything we want to do with those. All right. What about pizzas? What are some characteristics pizzas would have? OK. So pizzas, characteristics. Have a size. Um, you mentioned toppings. Maybe the type of crust. Maybe the sauce. Maybe any special instructions. And so on. What are some calculations we could we could calculate for a pizza? Price. What's another one? Pardon me? Bake time. How long to bake it? In fact, oh, what is the name of the place? There's a place in Collinwood. I have to Google this. That they make really thin crust pizzas in like a 800 degree oven. So it takes them like four minutes to make a pizza. So you order a pizza, it's like quicker than you could get a burger at Wendy's. Boom, there it is for you. So I got to look up the name for it because it was really good. Pizza Collinwood. Citizen Pie. It is in it is in Collinwood, which is like a, a neighborhood on the east side of Cleveland. Ooh, look at that. Oh yeah, yeah, go there definitely. Uh, do you know where the Beachland is ballroom? No. It would be across from the from the Beachland. All right. Anyhow, that would be good too. Calculate the bake time. Because the bake time might have to do with the size of the, 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 the kind of crust it has, right? A thick crust takes longer to, to bake than a thick crust would. Maybe a large takes longer than a small. Maybe not. I don't know. But there's some factors. Maybe depending on the toppings, it takes longer or shorter to bake. There could be a lot of factors that go into to that calculation. Then, I mean, we could get into other things, too. We could get into how much of each ingredient it, it has. You know, there might be a calculation. Maybe a calculation that a... Uh, a small pizza takes a certain number of ounces of flour, a certain number of ounces of tomato sauce, a certain number of ounces of cheese. A medium it has a different amount and so on. And that might be important. Again, if we, if we expand this from the original thing that we're going to look at and look at the, uh, a, a bigger system. The point is, is that everything we build into our, everything we ever want to know about a pizza should be in the pizza class. Any attribute it has, any calculations. We don't want code about the same thing in different places. All right? Because the problem then is it's going to be inconsistent. So if we had code to calculate the price of a pizza in the pizza class, and we had code to calculate the price of the pizza in some other class, those two classes could get out of sync. All right? And therefore, if you have duplicate code, it could get out of sync. You can get bad and accurate results. So this would be a class. These are the characteristics that we are interested in as far as a pizza goes. So I mean it always has to do with what's relevant for the system that you're building, right? I mean if, if we, could, we could have students, right? But if it was say the athletic department that was looking at student athletes, they might want different information than the academic divisions looking at students, all right? So, these are the attributes on a pizza. These are calculations or methods or whatever you want to call it. Now, the small cheese and pepperoni pizza 
that I ordered that sitting in the box right here would be an object is one member of that class. All right, a member of that class. Just like we have a class of student, and each one of you individually is a member of that class. So in software terms, you would be an object. All right, you're one member of that class. Now, in the class, we simply define that these properties exist. In an object, these properties actually have specific values. All right, so what I want to do now is I want to look at a little example. I think it, all it does is calculate the bake time and, and cost of, of a pizza. So let's go and look at this example. And we'll look at, at, at the code in the pizza class. And then we'll see how the unit test class that I talked about comes into play. Here is the pizza stuff. Let me go and extract the zip file. All right. Notice in here we have a pizza class and a unit test. We're going to leave the unit test for now. All right. I'm going to open up and edit the pizza class. Now, I simplified this. I didn't cover all the attributes that a pizza could have. All right? It's important, I think, to start small and to build. So I developed, I talked about three attributes. The kind of, the size it is, the kind of crust it has, and whether or not it has pepperoni. All right? Now the first two are strings. So one of the things that we'd have to do is create sort of a convention to say that our sizes are small, medium, and large, S, M, and L. And the, size, and the crust are either thin or thick. All right? And I think that's what I did. So these two are strings. This is a Boolean. A Boolean is a value that can either be true or false. It can't be anything else. I have six functions that are simply the attributes preceded by the word set and the word get. All right? I'm writing code in a very specific way that I think is the best standard to take. And that is, if you notice, the attributes are declared as private. All right? The attributes in this, in, in this course, we're going to make typically, with Rello, with almost no exceptions that I can think of, either private or protected. Um, we'll talk about protected later on in the course. But private means that no code outside of this class can access those attributes. All right? Why do I make why do I make attributes private? What's the advantage of doing that? Right. 
we want control over how these attributes get set. All right, is the bottom line. We want to make sure that these attributes get set in a certain way. If we made these public, then any code written in our application could go and do anything with these things. It could give an improper value, for example. We've defined that the crust has to be thick or thin. All right. Well, it could give medium or, I don't know, some other value. Yes, <laughs> you know, something that didn't make sense. Now, we don't have any validation code in here right now, but we're positioning ourselves so that we can write validation code in this class, and we can make sure that the attributes are set correctly, that no one could go in and just mess with these attributes. So instead, if any outside class wants to access these methods, either to give them a value or to get the value, we have to do that through a function. So we make it private, and then we have set and get functions. The set function takes whatever argument is given and sets the property to that value. So we have a set size, a set crust, a set has pepperoni. That allows us, and we'll see these in action in the, te the unit test. All right? This is just a way for the outside world to set the value, to say, well, this particular pizza is small. This particular pizza has thin crust, and this particular pizza doesn't have pepperoni on it. All right? And then to do the opposite, when printing out the receipt to say, what size is that pizza again? Was it thick or thin crust? Did it have pepperoni on it or not? So we can print, it, we can print out the receipt. Because remember, this component is going to be connected to a GUI at some point. And the user is going to choose through a checkbox or radio buttons or whatever, oh yeah, this one I want to be thick crust, this one I want to be small. So the choices that they make in the GUI has to go in to the pizza object that gets created. So we have to set these attributes somehow. By making them private, we can't set them direct or directly. So we have to give a mechanism to set those. And that's what the set and gets do. The sets allow us to give an argument, and we set the attribute to that. The gets do just the opposite. Now I have one more function here to calculate bake time. And it's a very simple rule. If it's thin crust, the bake time is 10 minutes. If it's thick crust, the bake time is 16 minutes, regardless of the size. Now, anyone that bakes pizzas, maybe they can tell me this is wrong or not. But this is the assumption that we're going by for this class. So it takes 10 minutes to bake a thin crust, 16 minutes to, to bake a thick crust. All right. So what do we do? We look to see if the crust attribute is equal to thin. If it is, then the bake time is 10 minutes. Otherwise, the bake time is 16 minutes, and we turn the bake time. Notice that this function, let's re remind ourselves the way the functions are set up. Word public means the outside world can use this function. All right? Double is the kind of value it's going to return. It's going to return a number, number that could include decimals. Here's the name of the function. Here's the arguments. Why are there no arguments to this function? Because there's already attributes for these things. So we're going to make sure the attributes get set, and then we're going to call the function. This function has an if statement in it, simply to look to see if the crust equals thin. This is how you compare strings, by the way, with the equals function. And then it returns either 10 or 16, depending whether it's thin or thick crust. Now, let's look at our unit test. All right. Remember, one of our, one of our classes needs a public static void function named main. 
that accepts a string array of arguments. So the unit test is sort of going to be the driving function of this little exercise we're doing, this little mini application that we're doing. All right. So it has the main function in it. Now, this next line, we're actually going to spend a lot of time talking about this line, um, not all of it today, but we're going to talk a little bit about it, a little bit about it, a little bit about it as the course proceeds. Pizza P equals new pizza. All right? Kind of a confusing um, statement. Pizza describes the type of variable P is. P is going to contain a pizza object. That's what pizza P means. We've seen variables before. In our other examples, we had string arrays. We could have integers or doubles or anything like that. All right? Pizza is a class. Remember, we can tell that because the word pizza is capitalized. P is our variable, all right, that points to a member of that class. P points then to an object, all right? It points to a specific pizza. Therefore, the, the variable P is sometimes called an object reference variable, all right? because it refers to an object. It points to a specific member of the class pizza. Well, what pizza does it point to? Does it point to the pizza that I had for lunch? Does it point for the pizza that, you know, someone ordered two weeks ago or whatever? It, create, it points to a brand new pizza object that we are creating here. That's what new pizza says on the right side of the equal sign. That says create a pizza object. Well, how does it know to create a pizza object? Well, it knows how to create a pizza object based on the code in the pizza class. So when it creates a pizza object, the pizza object contains all the things that can, are contained in the pizza class. So the pizza object has a size variable that's private. It has a crust variable that's private. It has a has pepperoni variable that's private, or attribute, I should say. It also has some set functions, some get functions, and a calculate bake time. So we create a brand new pizza that, don't have any, that doesn't have any values for any of those attributes. All right. And that new pizza is called P. All right? So whatever, whenever we see something like P dot set size, we are setting the size of the pizza that is named P. So again, if this is attached to a GUI, there'd be a drop down that says pick the size of pizza. And you'd pick large. And it would take the value of that drop down and put it in the pizza class. Here we're hard coding it. Now, a lot of times students look and say hard coding is not good. That's right under most circumstances. In this case, though, we're creating a test class. This class is not really part of the system. Eventually, this class will get replaced by a GUI. But we're not ready for that right now. So this sort of serves as the driver. This sort of substitutes for the GUI and gathers up all the parameters and sets them for the pizza. So. We create a brand new pizza. That's what this line says. And that brand new pizza's name is P. So we point to that pizza with the variable name P. So for that brand new pizza, I set the crust to be large. I, oh, I'm sorry, I set the size to be large. I set the crust to be thin. I set the pepperoni to be false. So these functions get called. Set size gets called. I take the size argument that gets passed to it, 
and store it in the attribute called size. So I'm filling up these attributes by using the set commands. I'm setting all the characteristics of the pizza through these set functions. So I have a pizza. Pizza has a size, a crust, and a pepperoni, but it doesn't know the values for it yet. I'm now telling the pizza object, well, you're a large pizza, you're thin crust, and you don't have pepperoni. I'm setting those attributes for that particular pizza. So, thin crust, no pepperoni. The last thing I'm doing is I'm saying system out, print ln, bake time is, and I'm displaying p calculate bake time. So what am I doing? I'm asking for that pizza. I'm asking what is to calculate the bake time. So what would be the bake time for this pizza? A large, no pepperoni, thin crust. 10 minutes. So this function will get called. It will initialize bake time at zero. It will look at the crust attribute, which got set up here to, ten, to uh, thin. All right. It is thin, therefore bake time equals 10. And the else won't execute, and it will return a 10. So let's, let's go and run this and see the results. CD into the desktop, CD into the pizza folder. I do DIR to see. I have two classes, two source code classes, the pizza Java, pizza.java and unit test.java. Now, if you notice, unit test uses the pizza class. So therefore, all I have to do is compile the unit test, and it will compile both of them. No news is good news. If I do a DIR, notice it now has a pizza.java and a unit test.java. So if a class uses another class, the compiler is smart enough to, co to, to compile the other class. So you don't have to go and compile every class individually. Now, sometimes if you're getting like a million errors, all right, you might say, wow, that's a million errors. I'm compiling all these classes. I might want to go and compile one class at a time, in which case, yeah, go ahead, compile one class, make sure it works compile the second class and so on. All right? But you don't have to. You can compile the main class and then all the classes should get compiled. Now to run this, bake time is 10 minutes. Yay, it worked. Did I do a good job testing this? No. Why not? Right, make sure the different combinations work. Now, in this case, there really is only one other possibility, the, the thick crust. But I should at least test that. Now, as the application gets bigger and bigger, maybe we adjust the bake time based on the kind of toppings it has or, or the size of the pizza or whatever. But I should minimally test two test cases. Why should I test two test cases? Because this function has two paths that it can go by. So I can't just say, well, that one worked. The other one must work then. Well, not necessarily. All right. So therefore, to do a better job on testing, I would go and I would test another pizza. And so I'm going to go. I'm going to put comments in my code that says, Test thin crust. Test 
test that crossed. Now, I'm going to say P2 equals new pizza. P2 set size, say small. and thick. Then I'm going to output P2. How many pizzas do I have in this routine, by the end of the routine? Two. Right? Easy way to do that is look and count the news. New means to make a new pizza. P2 equals new pizza. There it made a second new pizza. So every time you see a new, it's making a new object. So I'm going to go and save this. Compile it. Got to tell me the first pizza is ten dollars, the second or ten minutes, the second pizza is sixteen minutes. I probably should put fancy or output the not, but you get the idea. Now I can say, well, I did an, an okay job testing it because I tested the possibilities. Um, Good thing is, is you can, you can keep these unit tests for when you make changes to your class. That way you can go and verify that your change worked. All right. OK. Let's go and look at the next example out on Canvas. All right, I now have a folder called Pizza 1 somewhere that contains, again, the unit test and the Pizza Java. What have I done here? Absolutely nothing. All right, it's the same code. All right, never mind then. Let's go and grab. We'll start this. I don't know how far we'll get on it, uh, but we'll wrap it up on um, Monday of next week. Let's look at this pizza class. This pizza class has two main things that are different. It has constructors, and it has a calculate cost method. Calculate cost method is used to 
calculate the cost based on the rule that a small cost eight dollars, a medium cost ten, a large cost twelve, and if it has pepperoni, it's an extra buck, regardless of the size. Let's look at the unit test and run this guy. All right, the bake time for pizza one is 10, cost for pizza one is 12, bake time for pizza two is 16, cost for pizza two is 11. So let's look at the unit test. With the unit test, Notice that this line is a little different. This is called a constructor. A constructor is a special function. A constructor allows us to create an object and initialize variables at the same time. If you notice in the previous example, we had our constructor all right, and then we had a bunch of set methods. Here we're not using those set methods. It's a good idea to still have them, but we're not using them in this particular example. Now I said that in the previous one we had a constructor, even though there wasn't something called a constructor in the source. That's because there's a default constructor that's automatically created for you if you don't declare a constructor. In this case, I have two constructors. A constructor is simply public, followed by the name of the class and any arguments. So it's similar to a function. What this allows us to do is, if I give those arguments, those can be used to set the attributes. So I can set the size, I can set the crust, and I can set whether it has pepperoni as I'm creating the object. I can also, if I supply no arguments, I can default those things. Maybe the default pizza, if someone just says they want a pizza and don't give us any more information, maybe they get a medium thick crust pepperoni. That's the default. All right. So I have a constructor with no arguments that initializes those attributes to these particular values. And then I don't have to do the sets because the constructors set those attributes. But I can ask for the bake time and I can ask for the cost. If constructors aren't clear, we'll spend a lot more time on them next week All right, to talk about exactly what happens when a constructor runs and and how that all works and so on. All right, but now we have our pizza component that we have set the constructors for so that when we make a pizza, we can initialize those attributes to whatever we want them to be. All right? It's possible for a class to have multiple constructors. And typically what those are used for is you can manually set some properties and other properties you can default to some default val uh, value. All right, questions? on any of this. All right, we'll see you up in lab.